Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Smart Building Series webinar. And today we are talking about the Developers Smart Building Project Canvas. So I don't know if uh, you guys have been on our website over the last month or so, but we have published uh, this um, Project Canvas for Developers, which of course is the, is the uh, theme of today's webinar. And with me to talk about it today is the CEO of Vanti, Mike Bruman. How are you doing, Mike? Hi, Jim. Yeah, good to speak to you. Really well, thanks. You? Good. Yeah, I am excellent. Thanks. And yeah, of course, thanks to everybody out there who is listening in. Um, so uh, format for today is uh, pretty much the same as, as we do on most of, for those of you who are sort of returning webinar listeners. We, Mike and I are going to give a, an overview of, um, of, this, uh, of this project we've been working on. Um, and that's probably going to take 20 to 25 minutes. And then, you know, let's have some discussions. So very interesting to hear people's comments. Uh, be they, <laughs> be they uh, criticism or not, or ways that it could be improved, um, all, all good today. So, um, yeah, I think in terms of like just the housekeeping side of things, like if you do have questions, just feel free to put them in the Q&A box. And uh, Mike and I will see those as they come in and we can take them as they come. Um, also, uh, I would uh, push you towards the chat uh, box. If you haven't already, there's a link there to download the, um, the Canvas. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free, please to do that. Because I think as we go along and talk about it, it would be good for people to you know, have, have it open on your desktop so you can see it and uh, go, go along. So I'll, I'll run through how we're gonna do that in a minute. Um, yeah, other piece of housekeeping is we are recording this session as always. That's gonna go up on our YouTube channel probably tomorrow. Um, so feel free to share it with um, your customers, your team, you know, anyone really who you think would benefit from, from what we're going to talk about today. Um, so, yeah, and of course, um, again, I really need to thank uh, Mike Avanti and also LMG, um, both Master Systems Integrators, who actually took the time to, you know, help us develop this. Um, and here it is. So this is, this is what we came up with. Uh, and it's, it's quite a simple tool, really. Um, and that's what we're going to be, be discussing today. Uh, and I'll just talk a little bit more then, right, about what it is and what it isn't. And Mike, you know, feel free to chime in or maybe give you some time at the end. You can um, you can add some add some of your initial thoughts. Um, so as I said, first of all, you know, please feel free to download it. There's the link, um, and you can share that with with whoever. So so essentially, what we're talking about today is is that it's a free template right for developers of commercial real estate that want to start adopting technology in their buildings and i think the key word there is probably um start you know this is a this is a fairly simple um template for people who perhaps don't have um much experience with uh smart building projects uh, and we see it as perhaps um a, you know a foot in the door uh, to to getting started, Mike. Is that you know anything to add at this point? Yeah, I think um, the reason that we were so keen when you uh, approached us to work with you uh, on this was that um, we see this a lot in the market at the moment. That um, people are, are approaching us, kind of saying, you know, one smart building, um, but there's a lot of things that they need to have thought about beforehand. And so I think to your point, it is um, designed to be. Uh, really a conversation starter. It is a very simple tool by its nature, um, but it is also designed to ideally walk you through a bit of a process uh, and get you to a, a set of results that allows you as a property developer or your clients who might be property developers um, to uh, really go into uh, projects that are being enabled in a smart way um, with some really tangible outcomes, which uh, in developers' minds, often in our experience, equates to pounds, pence, or dollars and cents, depending on where you are in the world. Yeah, exactly, and that's kind of the third point, right? That this is the why of this, you know, driving driving success. And and as you pointed out, like maybe people don't actually 
understand at the beginning what success is or what su success might look like and and also then you know being able to appropriately budget for that uh, and we're going to come on to all of that so of these um uh, so let me just pull it up again you know of these seven kind of steps that we identified we're going to go through now all of those in turn and basically just break them down a little bit um, and discuss what we think the key the kind of key points from each of them are. Uh, then what else to say? Well, I mean, this is, first of all, uh, an open source document. And I think like that was important to us to make it that. Um, so what does that really mean? Well, it just means that it's, it's under a uh, Creative Commons license, which effectively means you are, anybody is free to share it, also to modify it as well. So if you want to take this um, and modify it either to your own needs within your team or, or be that actually maybe like clients that you work with, if you, you want to take it to them, put it in front of them um, and add things that you think they're appropriate, you can do that. Um, the only thing we ask is that the attribution is maintained. Uh, and then I think I would add also, again, an important point, like this isn't a standard or certification. So we're not trying to you know, get you to a point where you've achieved a certain level of, let's say, smart in your building. But really what this is, is, um, is an initial conversation starter, an initial um, set of questions that you can ask yourself or uh, your partners who are working for. And then, you know, maybe that is one of the, the goals, right, that you want to achieve is some standard or certification. And again, that helps you um, identify that, right? Again, Mike, I mean, is that something that um, you've uh, you've thought about? Like, I don't know. I mean, with the people you work with, is it like achieving certification or a standard important to them? Yeah, I think there's um, an increasing number of them out there um, at varying different degrees and coming at it from varying different perspectives. I think um, it certainly is one of the, of the outcomes of the canvas. Um, I think from our perspective, um, uh, and uh, I think generally our view is that we want people to have a great experience within the built environment. And so um, from that perspective, uh, yes, certifications are important. Yes, they're a great demonstrator of capability, um, but really we need to be thinking about buildings as uh, spaces where people spend an awful lot of their time um, and we want that time to be uh, spent as productively and as comfortably as, as possible. One thing I was just going to mention, and very quickly as well, Jim, just before you move away from the um, Creative Commons, is the um, share alike attribute on the license as well. So um, we are putting this out there as a starter. People are welcome to modify it, as Jim said, but also um, the idea of, of that license is that further modifications or um, kind of developed versions of it are shared back with the community because um, belief is that we can continue to, to make this better. And as Jim's mentioned, you know, very much a a starting point um, that hopefully we can all build from. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the purpose of sort of, of doing this today as well is to get feedback or to get people interested in developing it. Exactly. Great. So um, let's go through the seven steps. Um, how, how about this, Mike? Maybe we take one, um, one each, right? Or we'll just go through them one on one and then we can sort of have a discussion about them as we go. So maybe I'll kick off then. So the, I mean, Again, number one, key project goals and value proposition. This, this I think, really um, builds on what Mike just said earlier, right, about some of the conversations that he has with clients, um, about what they about what they say, perhaps when they first approach a master system integrator or or a consultant, someone to help them on a building project. You know, rather than just saying, "Well, we want to achieve something smart." let's sort of try and make that um, a more tangible like um, goals and, and a more tangible value proposition. So asking questions along the lines of, you know, what are the problems that you face and that you want um, technology to help solve in your building? Um, so for example, one thing might be, um, you know, in terms of if you're if this is if you're a landlord, like what tenants are you trying to attract? 
and therefore based on that you know what type of technology will will help to attract them um, and then yeah so in terms of what outputs you could have from that we already mentioned certification as mike said there's there's a few of them now we've listed some of them there um, that could absolutely be um, uh, an, ex an example of a goal for your smart building project um, other interesting ones like kind of touched on uh, tenant experience already energy of course like massive topic in itself um, so you know a very simple goal might be to reduce energy costs but you could quite conceivably go much further into that um, and come up with some some really quite granular outputs of things you want to achieve um, optimizing space again be interesting to hear mike's thoughts on this um, that's something that is um, very i think interesting um, at the moment a lot of companies looking to optimize um, their their commercial real estate and uh, especially in this kind of new hybrid work environment that a lot of people are finding themselves in and last interesting one i think is like compliance you know it might be some issues around um you know let's say you have a disparate uh, portfolio of buildings it could be for example retail Maybe you want to use technology to to manage that that portfolio um, better. Um, yeah, Mike, any any thoughts on that? What is your? I mean, are you here? Are these some of these outputs things that you do hear from clients, or do you need to push them in this in this direction? Yeah, hundred percent. So I think um, you framed it exactly right there, Jim. This is the this is the why bother, right? This is the the big elevator pitch. If you're going to the board to tell them that you're going to make all of their their buildings smart in the portfolio. Um, so what are we looking to get out of it? And I think what we're starting to see um, out in the market, and we've had some panic phone calls from um, some operators and landlords in terms of the building next to me is going smart. I need to be smart. Tell me how to do it. But I think the, the people that are going to win out here are ultimately the people that are starting to provide um, services to people. So uh, I think the, the days are over now uh, of... Um, you know, here's a lovely building in a prime uh, bit of a city or, or somewhere. Uh, it's got a lovely view out the window, pay us a rent check every quarter. Um, I think people are now looking much more at um, particularly office buildings, but I think even uh, when we think of residential now, mm. as um, particularly retail, as you mentioned, actually, as real kind of destinations, like people are looking for an experience when they go there. Um, and if that's an office building, it's about how am I, you know, collaborative with others, how am I productive? Is it worth going through the um, arduous nature of my commute to get there? Um, so this framing is is super important and, and probably, you know, of all of the things that we've got down on the page, it's, it's really the understanding and spending a good amount of time here in terms of, you know, where do, where do we want our buildings to be in the market? You know, are we going to be a, a budget operator and actually we're going to, market ourselves on, on the low cost side of things. Are we going to be super premium? Are we going to be helping people reinforce their brands? So yeah, spending a good amount of time here uh, and looking at those outputs, definitely important. But um, yeah, we're certainly uh, hearing and watching a good amount of these conversations unfold on you know, uh, social media as well. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. And I think you, you've got some good examples of, um, I'd add to retail also, um, sport and um stadium as well right like there's some really good examples of uh technology being used in yep. in that sure. asset class as well right like with really a, um improving the not just the fan experience but the whole kind of way that those way stadia operate as well fascinating so let's move on to two mike do you want to do you want to kick this one off yeah sure thing so you, I think this is starting to look at like, right, we've defined the why. Um, this middle band is really now looking a bit more at the, the kind of how we're going to do it. So um, this could be really deemed as the kind of initiation phase, if you like, like what, what are we going to, what, what's our next step? So define what we'd like it to look like, but where are we going to go from here? So um, things here around, uh, and we're going to move into more of this a bit later on, but you know, who do we need to appoint? Who needs to help us come on the journey? We're in the next step after that. But um, do we need to do anything first? So particularly if we're starting to look at retrofitting a building, so 
bringing buildings out of the ground from scratch and embedding smart in them. More straightforward than it has been, still not without its complications, particularly around uh, data coordination and that kind of thing. But for a retrofit, if we've got an existing portfolio that we're looking to upspec, do we need to go and audit everything? Do we need to go and um, kind of work through um, what we've already got? And then also, if we are kind of portfolio managers, if we have a, a number of buildings under our, our kind of uh, command, are there existing systems and applications that we might want to take in from our portfolio perspective in terms of making sure that we can connect those to the building? And that, I think, in terms of use cases on the top of my head, things like metering are immediate examples, like lots of landlords always talk about, you know, how terrible getting metering data is, accurate recharging to tenants, all of that kind of thing. So actually, if you can start to think about those end-to-end -end workflows early, it's much easier to achieve those results um, at the back end of a project, even, uh, either as uh, retrofit completes or as um, uh, kind of practical completion uh, is achieved on the building and the, and the doors fly, fly open on, on day one. Uh, and then some practical stuff that we've got in there, um, starting to think forward into, into those metrics, what's going to um, mean things to people later on? So what do we need to capture? What do we need to um, write down? The way to think about this is almost a bit of a golden thread through the project. What we want to make sure is the things that we're defining now um, are going to appear at the end. Um, once they've been handed over between kind of, you know, design teams, main contractors, fit out contractors, uh, and the rest of the supply chain. Yeah, exactly. A question for you actually, Mike, like when you work on retrofit products or projects, how often do you actually get like, a, or have people, the client gone and done a, an accurate audit of what they have? Um, yeah, it's been a big range. Uh, <laughs> I won't name them, um, but we have had large financial institutions that we've um, looked at some buildings of where uh, they can't turn the lights off in their building because the per person who knew how the system worked uh, disappeared and no one had any documentation. Now, it's a bit of an extreme example, um, but I think we need to start appreciating that there are going to be buildings like this out there, and particularly with the focus on, um, you know, drive to net zero. Uh, we are going to have to potentially unpick some, some real doozies. So I think this is where cost gets factored in with, with retrofit. There are some reasonably key times in terms of refurbishment that it makes sense to upset things to smart. If you have something that's just been finished and you're going to retrofit into it, um, it can look very expensive to do that in the traditional way, uh, but that might be where then looking at uh, kind of other technologies, kind of you know, wider sensors, um, mesh networks, more IoT-esque uh, solutions, may be more applicable in that space to get what you need. Mm. Yeah, and I guess it's a, a, a case, again, this could be another initial action, right, is that actually maybe prioritizing, creating a plan for what system is first in line to be upgraded, right, and what can, what can wait. Um, I mean, we did a webinar at the end of last year with this really interesting Finnish startup. And then they were talking about that. They created this um, bit of technology actually to kind of extend the life of some uh, building management systems because of, you know, they were working with some clients who had a lot of legacy equipment and it just didn't have the budget to do, you know, all like expensive um, upgrades all at the same time. Great. Okay, so let's move on to three. So I'll start this one off. So I guess, you know, like with most projects, of course, like you're going to um, require the right partners. Um, you're not going to be able to do um, everything yourself. Of course, you know, depending on, you know, who you are as an organization, you may quite well have some internal um, resources, of course, to, to rely on. But you know, in most cases, I would say probably would benefit you to look at some, you know, external partners to help. And then I think some key considerations then, um, and a partner, you know, it might be uh, someone like Mike's or company or LMG, right, that, that actually provide that integration piece. It might be 
more of a consultant role, um, you know, but also we're talking about vendors, right? As partners, like who do you select in terms of, you know, the people to provide you with the technology? And I think, I don't know about your perspective, Mike, but like, you know, the fourth one here, I think is, is really important, right? You want to, you want to try to make sure that you don't get locked into to one vendor ecosystem. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, 100%. I think, um, well, and we've seen recently in the, the news this week around uh, Johnson Controls starting to um, pursue people for, for patent violations. I think what's becoming quite apparent is that the, the big four in this space um, really do want to uh, maintain their kind of long-term contracts and um, hold that they've had over the industry for, for many, many years. I think there's absolutely a place if um, people are um, particular fans of, of technology and, and buying everything through one vendor. Uh, there's certainly a case for that at times, but I think um, most property developers would really benefit from a, a best of breed approach. Uh, and that's where uh, kind of going through and defining uh, the experience that you actually want to deliver to people who are occupying the building and also op um, operating the building as well um, is really, really important because once you've got those um, functions down, you understand what they are and what the building actually needs to, to do, um, then, yeah, you can go out and uh, approach the appropriate vendors with the right technologies. So I would definitely advocate uh, doing it that way, but also, um, yeah, very clear that some people... Uh, do you want everything in uh, green, blue, red, uh, and any other of the, the kind of uh, big four colours? That That is for some people. But yeah, yeah. Uh, by accident, I, I guess as long as, you know, you've, you've got your eyes open, right, and you're doing it for the right reason, if you know that that's, that's, what, that's what you want, then, then that's what you want. But as you said, like the best of breed approach, I think, is, um, you know, would make sense in in a lot of other kind of uh, scenarios, probably the majority of scenarios. I mean, one thing though, I think like, again, interested in your opinion on this, because from our perspective, like we know like there's just, especially with specific certain technologies, there's so many vendors out there. It is a challenge, right? For someone who doesn't, let's say again, like this document is supposed to be for, for people starting their smart, their smart building journey or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Like, comparing or like understanding who best of breed is right is it must be a real challenge yeah for sure and i think um if uh, the, there's a few different ways that we're seeing people approach it i think um some developers are uh, bringing expertise in-house um having someone uh, sit within their teams to be able to uh, do that kind of technical analysis and um work through people in uh, with work through with vendors in that way. Um, I think other people uh, are going out to the market, so um, engaging consultants to help them do that, um, vendor selection, making sure that they've, um, uh, they're have they bringing the expertise required on a, a kind of contract basis. Mm. Um, and then I think other people are taking a bit more of a, um, not quite a suck it and see approach, but they're tending to do kind of um, smaller deployments or pilots um, to work out what works well for them, what they like the look of, um, before kind of rolling that out across a number of buildings. And I think the other thing is, if you're starting down this journey with the kind of I don't know, first building in a portfolio or first building on a campus or whatever it might be, um, I would go into it, as you were saying earlier, kind of eyes wide open in terms of this is an iterative process. And so it's about that learning and refinement through the process, being able to change things over time and ultimately working towards something that can allow you to standardize across a portfolio um, and be able to uh, kind of bring some consistency because I think um, we are early in this market, it's important that we recognize that. Um, and we're not quite yet at that um, mass market position of, you know, everyone's adopting it. So um, yeah, we need to, need to balance those things out. Mm. Yep, absolutely. Uh, one else that I want to pick out from his, um, probably the last point there before the example outputs, um, do you have the skills and ability to define building use cases for personas? Um, again, I think that's a really, really important point at this stage, right? Like, do you know and can understand 
really understand the people that are using your building and what what they want and the use cases um, that technology can can help provide right um, I mean how do you work Mike how do you work with clients on that I mean do you sit down with them and just you know go through it and just try and pick their brains or or do they come to you with that yeah I think it's changed for us since um, so we did our first building in 2015 uh, and I think it's fair to say our approach has changed so um, early on it was very much about you know gathering kind of all requirements I think we're in a, a reasonable kind of Pareto place now. I think um, probably about 80% of, of requirements for, for people's buildings in, in any particular sector are uh, becoming a lot more normalised, so a bit more of a given. Um, certainly developers that we're working with at the moment um, are coming to us with, you know, we want smart bike racks or we want smart lockers or the ability to notify you know, people of mail in, in the post room and that kind of thing. So I think um, one thing I'd recommend if this is uh, kind of brand new to people is um, go and look at what um, uh, your peers are shouting about, because I think um, that will get you off to a, a good running start. And there are a good number of kind of uh, case studies out in the world now. Mm. In terms of the remaining 20 percent, I think um, what we're seeing there are, are really the, the kind of flourishes. So uh, going back to what I was saying earlier about um, you know, owners and landlords now really needing to uh, start to look to provide a proper service, it's what can you um, market as a differentiator? Uh, and that's really where that last 20% gets made up. So what, what's the difference? How does it apply particularly to um, a trade sector or the local community or um, to your point earlier about stadiums, like how do we make it really applicable to fans? What makes a great fan experience? So um, it really is building out that overall experience. And I think uh, it's probably worth saying at this point as well, uh, related to the, the kind of lock-in that we talked about and, and looking at best of breed is how do you make that experience for an individual really consistent? Uh, and one of the things that we've talked about with a few of our commercial clients is how do you make that curb to desk experience really seamless really fluid you know uh, get through in through the entrance uh, get into a lift really easily get to your floor check into a desk uh, and everything is you know nice and easy all the way through and even the maintenance around it you know I've lost a card okay it's easy to go and get another one um, I'm a new employee it's easy for me to be issued with the credentials that I need all of those kind of bits and pieces um, really need to be factored into the building experience. Mm. Yeah. Good. All right. We'll just finish off this uh, part three with, you know, some of these example outputs. And they're just really, you know, the idea of those is in this document is to just, um, you know, provide some examples, right, of, of one possible outcome from the from these different steps. But in this case, of course, you know, you might want to develop detailed RFP documents if you are going and looking for a particular vendor and, and, and a way of at least, you know, being able to assess like the market and, and who the right the right vendors for you might be. Uh, had a good comment here come in um, and it says an important thing to think about before selecting partners is how you want to finance the solution, CapEx, OpEx, as not all partners will offer these different types of solutions indeed and actually i think we do make reference to that in a bit so yes here we are Ta -da. yep mike do you want to kick this one off yep sure thing so uh, couldn't agree more with that that comment and i think um uh, we've been on a project recently where it's been uh, very surprising that the um uh, developers opted for a set of network infrastructure that requires an ongoing um, subscription at quite a premium, which uh, makes complete sense if you're a, uh, a corporate with lots of devices or need to maintain uh, kind of guest networks and all that kind of thing. But when you think most building operations technology um, broadly sits in the background, has very little in the way of you know, heavy bandwidth requirements, it really does feel like a, a real kind of overage on spend. Um, we had a, a, another example recently as well with um, a client who wanted to do footfall counting within their building, sign themselves into a solution, not realising that there was a £50,000 a year um, OPEX subscription that went along with it. And um, yeah, just, yeah, could not get, well, we could, couldn't get our heads around it in terms of um, the value being delivered. But I think this is really where uh, looking at that kind of total life cycle 
um, cost, and, and we'll touch on this a bit later in the in the future proofing section as well. But um, over the course of the lifespan of the technology, and I think um, you know, I always refer to um, Jim's amazing uh, graphic in terms of um, the, the different life cycles of things like um, facades and mechanical and electrical equipment going all the way down to kind of um, device firmware. Really, you want to be looking at a kind of building operation technology on probably a three to 10 year life cycle at most. And so um, it really is important to uh, factor in both the CapEx and the OpEx over that period and doing your vendor comparisons on that total um, life cycle basis. So um, definitely really important to think about uh, up front. Uh, and then I think uh, there's also the, the wraparound costs and the uh, thinking about costs that you can put in early uh, and almost having this crescendo effect through the rest of the program in terms of, uh, there's mention about um, cyber there, but in terms of things like integration and design, um, we're seeing quite a few projects at the moment where specs are being released in, in quite a traditional way with the expectation of smart outcomes. And so design teams haven't necessarily put thought into how systems are going to be integrated together and that is then novated over to a, uh, a main contractor and supply chain that are left to do that as part of uh, con contractor design portions that can introduce quite substantial risk um, and thinking back to the the kind of golden thread that i mentioned earlier through the through the project is if you're not taking care of the specifics over how things are going to talk to each other from a, a kind of system to system basis, or ideally your design team aren't, the risk is that the outcome of that in terms of further down the line when the building actually opens or that the refurbishment is complete, doesn't actually line up with what the original requirements are. So um, it is really important if you're going to manage that risk to try and get whilst it might be a slight uplift in terms of um, initial design fees or technical specialists uh, kind of getting involved at, at that level of detail um, at the design point, if it's left to run through the build program um, and there's no direction to the contractor that they need to deliver a particular experience, which is also something that we're seeing um, very commonly at the moment, um, everyone's understanding of smart buildings is entirely different. Uh, and you could ask, 50 people out in the world what smart building is, and you would likely get 50, potentially some similar, but uh, very different answers. Mm. So I, I think it is about um, making sure that we're addressing that as much as possible design side, so that it allows people who are um, building, supplying, installing, commissioning um, to just do a great job. Uh, and I think one of the things that uh, is actually mentioned a bit further down as well, just on, on in terms of um, pay as you lease, there are quite a few vendors now um, looking much more at consumption based models, uh, particularly where there are SaaS solutions and particularly where they're into a retrofit environment, um, where they're almost bundling the hardware along with those um, SaaS offerings. So that is becoming um, a little more popular. But um, can also be very expensive. And I think um, one of the things that I would um, definitely recommend here, particularly if you're in a reasonably significant um, refurbishment or a new building, is for every offering where there is a, a SaaS subscription, um, you nearly always can find an offering without one. And so uh, I would definitely um, challenge yourself to remove the OPEX component as far as possible. Um, particularly on sensors that are broadly fixed and just doing one task. So thinking about footfall, as I mentioned earlier, but also things like occupancy, air quality, all of that kind of stuff. If there isn't anything super special in the SaaS platform in terms of um, you know, analyzing that data or helping you understand where you are against you know, a, a full rank of all the other customers and, and things like that, um, really do drive hard on the value in terms of what you're getting for that OPEX or, or subscription costs for sure. Mm, that's really interesting, Paul. Because I guess that gets overlooked. And as well, of course, from a vendor perspective, everyone has been trying to move towards this more sort of uh, SaaS model, right? And um, perhaps it's uh, it's not appropriate for the for the client in all in all cases. In fact, I'm sure it's not. Often not for every system, but it yeah. definitely has its place for some for sure. Yeah. Um, got to pick out here as well, like this um, 
you know, we mentioned briefly, right, cybersecurity and mitigating those kind of risks. I mean, we know it's like been a been a hot uh, an issue for quite a while, remains an issue. Um, you know, we said here an example output of that might be to, you know, ensure that hardware, software from a vendor has been tested and validated to current cybersecurity standards. But, you know, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Like, it is really a complicated subject. I mean, how do you, how would you approach this with, with clients, Mike? Yeah, so um, we do this at the moment for people, uh, so in two ways. One um, is we're bringing things into the project, um, so things are uh, security validated, and that is um, if a device is connecting to the network in any way, uh, so wired or wireless, um, we'll receive one of those units in advance of it being deployed on site, and then we'll run a set of um, security tests against it. Uh, again, won't name names, but we have had a fire alarm in the last uh, month that was like Swiss cheese from a security perspective. And um, you could, uh, if you knew what you were doing, set off the fire alarm and worse, set off the sprinklers um, just by getting through some vulnerabilities that, that they left open in the product. So I think we need to appreciate that um, all of these different uh, previously very disparate proprietary systems are now making their way onto the network, but actually most of those system vendors are system specialists in what they set out to do, whether that be fire, lighting, BMS, access control, any other system. Mm. And, and so this move into the network is a new frontier for them. And so inevitably there will be the potential of some cybersecurity risks. They can be mitigated. Um, and so what we do is we send uh, contracts and vendors a report back um, highlighting particular security concerns and making recommendations. In a good proportion of time, they can be fixed by configuration options by the contractor on site. Occasionally, they have to go back to the vendor um, to be remediated by them with new firmware versions and that sort of thing. Mm. And then when we get to the end of a project, um, one of the things that we're uh, doing then is having done the validation internally around um, devices, uh, we have people uh, in terms of developers now who are asking for independent um, cybersecurity audits uh, of our work, which um, we absolutely advocate because, um, yeah, we shouldn't be, you know, marking around homework. Um, but also it gives them the assurance that they've had someone independent um, validate our security approach on the project as well. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a really wise move, isn't it? Like if you're going to spend money on external uh, advice and on and anything cyber security would surely be one of those topics at the near the top of the list right it's um it's extremely important as that kind of uh, example you gave earlier about the fire alarm demonstrates yes yeah, a lot of damage you can do with sprinklers in the building yeah <laughs> indeed <laughs> Uh, well, we'll move on to five, but um, just and again, remind people, like if you've got any comments, but also questions, um, put them in the Q&A or even in the chat, we'll, we'll see them there as well. So five, um, really, so this is then sort of, we're moving um, along this sort of chain of, of um, you know, of delivery, right? So we're now, um, this is the management and delivery phase. So, you know, essentially saying like, you know, when you're in the, when you're in the thick of the project, you know, who is responsible for managing the project and ensuring it is delivered on time and on budget, but it could have, because of course we know, you know, timings do tend to slip. And if you, there isn't someone that you can point to who, you know, is responsible for things, then, uh, they won't uh, accept that responsibility. So, and again, you know, who be aware of who the key stakeholders are and um, can they sign off on these things? You know, it's really sort of, I guess, basic project management stuff for some people, but um, you know, these are points that are worth reiterating, right? Um, and again, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll take this one because um, again, Mike says he shouldn't uh, mark his own homework, <laughs> but you know, if <laughs> Do you need a master systems integrator or a smart building consultant to help engage to ensure effective delivery? Like that's surely, you know, if you don't have those, those skills internally, then you should ideally go and see if you can find the right partner. 
Um, yeah, and then I think the final point there um, about processes in place, and I think, again, like if I was going to pick out one thing, me personally with this, it would be, you know, about ensuring proper, not just installation, but commissioning of technology. You know, I've spoken to people over the years who say that a lot of equipment isn't commissioned properly. Um, and again, that's really not ideal, right? Like if you're going to spend all this money, um, you want to make sure that it's working correctly. Mike, any thoughts on that? What do you see in terms of, you know, commissioning of, of uh, equipment? Yeah, definitely. I think um, really key part, if you're um, bringing in lots of different systems to the building, make sure that there's um, clear, clear demarcation between people so um, that they know when their commissioning finishes and when uh, what we're referring to more and more as digital commissioning commences. So when um, master systems greater or, or others are plugging back into those systems, um, getting that line really clear so everyone knows what they're on the hook for and what the expectations are at that point. Um, I think the other really important thing um, that you mentioned there on uh, sign off, because you've got so many, uh, and I've just seen a uh, question arrive around um, kind of operators and facilities managers, mm -hmm. you've got so many different stakeholders who have a lens and a view on this single built asset. It is really important to understand um, what each of them needs out of it. Uh, and I think, um, in fact, even conversation um, we were having earlier on uh, today with a, a partner company, um, they were talking about the, um, the need to bring operational teams further forward in terms of the construction process, because although we have you know, good initiatives like soft landings and all those kind of things, um, with the amount of data that's now being generated um, through BIM models and naming and everything else during the construction process, we really need to make sure that we have operational teams that are stood up and ready to receive that. Because otherwise, as soon as those data sets start falling out of sync, you've um, spent a huge amount of money and you're going to have a building off operator or a facilities management company, uh, or you're going to have to bear the cost internally yourself in um, going back through and making sure that that data is relevant. Because as soon as there's one asset tag or one label that you can't rely on, um, you'd be surprised how much that undermines confidence in, in the entire data set. And um, in some of the buildings that we're in, uh, particularly some of the larger ones, an exercise of um, you know, double checking asset tags on every asset that's gone in as part of uh, construction or refurbishment would be uh, significant. Mm. Yeah, that's um, something I've never considered, but it makes perfect sense, right? You've got to ensure that you maintain the, the, those data standards throughout the whole project, right? Otherwise, it's um, pointless in, in a way, right? If you're not, if people, if everyone's not talk, singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah, totally. Should we take this question then? Um, how do you talk about providing a return on time for building operators, facilities managers? Um, in, I mean, throwing the question as um, essentially what's the return, i.e. how much time are we saving them later? Yeah, I would say so. Well, how do you talk about that? So um, I guess, yeah, how do you, how would you sell that as a concept? Like if you were... <laughs> um, at this stage in the industry, with great difficulty probably, but I'll have a go. Um, so I think, as I mentioned earlier on, um, we're reasonably early stages in terms of if you look at the number of buildings in the world and then the um, subsection of, of that um, is very small. That's actually uh, kind of um, smart enabled. Oh, OK, regards to monitoring and maintaining. Got it. Yeah. So I think um, from a, a savings perspective, um, we can demonstrate quite significant savings, both from an energy perspective well, actually, from an energy perspective, space uh, perspective, and also um, e efficiency in terms of operational teams. So energy, um, rough metrics are we aim for about 50% saving uh, kind of compared to other floors in the same building if you smart enable it. Um, from a space perspective, um, pre-pandemic, we thought we we're in a position where um, operating things at kind of 1.4, 1.7 people to one desk was you know, pretty heady in terms of relation um, uh, ratios between those two things. 
Um, one of our clients has just hit a ratio of seven to one. Um, so that's seven people to every one desk um, because of how they've changed their working styles. So they, those are changing quite significantly. Um, and then savings wise, we've been able to save clients um, up to about one and a half million pounds a year in terms of um, team savings. And that's um, allowing them to reallocate uh, their spend. So um, bringing, uh, rather than hiring out lots of event spaces, bringing that back internally, um, but also a reduction headcount in terms of those people needed to maintain assets where we've been able to um, implement automation. So reasonably significant in, in that regard. In terms of the um, follow up around monitoring and, and maintaining, I think it's about getting the right data to the right people. And this talks to um, the, the last bit that we're going to come on to in, in terms of KPIs is, um, you know, the old adage of, of what gets measured gets managed. But it, it's about making sure that those metrics are meaningful to the people who are actually going to need to take action from them. So um, air quality is an example. It's great that we could be reporting a uh, thousand parts per million. I mean, be, nearly dead at that stage, I think, with CO2 in a, in a room. But, um, you know, it, it's all very well being able to report that stuff, but what do we do about it? And, and so I think in terms of that return on time, it's you can surface the information without having to do things like, you know, getting people to walk around and do surveys and all those kind of things. But it's about making it clear about what's important to the building and the team that are running it. And that's where you can then start to think about things like, so do you do uh, cleaning on a usage basis if a floor hasn't been used? Well, actually, we can return an awful lot of time to people if they don't then need to go and clean it. Um, but in the current environment, we find ourselves coming out of the global pandemic. Do we want to tell people that we're not cleaning spaces? And so these are the things that are supposed to be conversation starters through the canvas, right? Is what are we comfortable with in terms of how we operate our buildings? Um, and what is, the, what is the amount of time that we think we can give back? And also, can we spend that time more effectively elsewhere? Because things like, you know, trawling hundreds of BMS alarms every day, unless you can actually take action with them and do something about it, it broadly is a complete waste of time. So yeah. it, it is really factoring in the, the people as much as the technology. No, that's a great point. Absolutely, absolutely. So six, future proofing. Mike, would you like to lead on this one? Yeah, sure thing. So I think um, we've, we've touched on a lot of this already and, and conscious of um, wanting to get into some more questions, right? So yes, I, I think it's about, um, it's about following those rhythms that are defining the wonderful um, memory graphic um, and, and thinking about uh, ensuring that there is operational expenditure to refresh those things at a time and point. What we don't want is um, the doors flying open on building day one and people walking in and being like, God, this is so, you know, 2018 or whatever. Um, and we need to make sure that, that doesn't fade over time. So I think the other thing I'd um, kind of throw caution to here is um, try not to implement bells and whistles. So, um, you know, going back to everything that we've talked about through today and, and leading into the KPI section next is, you know, what does it mean? Why, why do you have it there? You know, we don't all need confetti cans going off in receptions every day, so we don't spend money on them, but it would be easy to think that it I don't know, might be a great way to welcome guests or something like that. I just think it's about making sure that we've got spend um, in the right place. It's also um, about, and actually it's uh, point two here, where we've got um, interoperability and the ability to change systems over time. I think the analogy I've always used here is a toaster. Toasters are great. They sit on the side um, in your kitchen, toast bread all the time. One day they break and you have to throw them away. And that's how we treat building technology at the moment. What we need to do is move to the position of being able to change systems over time and expect change. You only have to look at um, the number of Victorian buildings that are still standing today because they're wonderfully engineered, but they are used for very different purposes to those which they were potentially opened with or um, originally envisaged. So it's about ensuring the technology choices that we're making um, allow us that level of, of change and fluidity over time. And as we've also touched on there, making sure that we've got open data standards in there because and also I'll go a bit further than that into data portability. So 
if you are going out to cloud and SaaS vendors, if you are engaging those people, making sure that your data is your own, um, because I think, um, well, there are a, a lot of examples out in the world of, of people who have had their data locked into particular platforms and haven't been able to extract it due to contractual obligations and that kind of thing. Um, it, it is ensuring that you are in the best place that, you know, should a vendor um, not be around anymore, should, um, uh, you know, their terms change, should there be a contractual falling out, you want to make sure that from a building perspective, you own everything to do with that asset. And I think what we're going to see is that those historical records of building performance, particularly as we move towards um, net zero targets in 2030, actually become ever more valuable as buildings are um, bought and sold. Mm. Yeah, uh, completely agree. And I would only add to that, that um, you know, there's been quite a lot of work over the last few years that various groups have done in the industry on open data standards. And I think, you know, you should build on that if you can, and you are, you build, let's build on that work, right? Because, um, you know, there's some smart people been working on these, pro on these um, problems. And, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, can, can use it, then I think it will certainly benefit um, your smart building project. So let's uh, move on to the last one. And again, I think, you know, like with the similar with, with, with one, right, this is basically just saying, you know, effectively, how are we going to measure the success of our project, which is, you know, I guess, standard for, for a lot of people. But again, this is, we're just trying to, you know, give people the template to understand, you know, if, how they might walk through this if they've just started. So, um, yeah, I mean, really, um, again, what, what is it and what, and at what frequency do you want to measure things and, and what is most important to you? And I think by the time you've probably got, you know, you've, if you've worked your way through this canvas and you get to seven, you probably have like a, you know, a pretty good idea. Right. Um, but, and we give some examples there, um, whether that be a certification that you've achieved um, or things like, you know, um, increasing your rental yield by a certain percentage or, or the satisfaction of tenants. Um, again, and you may want to think of those as, you know, there could be qualitative and quantitative objectives that you, that you want to get from your, your smart building uh, project. I mean, Mike, any sort of examples that you've seen in your work um, that where people have achieved, you know, a specific out, output that they've, a, K, a KPI? Yeah, I think um, it's, uh, start small and get bigger. I think um, we've been involved in some projects where uh, people have come almost with a kind of laundry list of um, metrics that they want to um, get out of the building. But I think um, when you start kind of drilling into the, well, why do you want that? Or why is it important? Um, actually, you can almost kind of say, shake the sieve and, and very few um, will, will drop through. Um, and I think make it meaningful to people. So um, a bit like the, the kind of um, return on time question earlier on, you know, how do you make building operators super effective at what they're doing? What do they actually need to do a really great job? And mm. too much data in that regard can almost become, you know, you're starting to kind of look for needles and data haystacks. Um, no pun intended, although it's already worked. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I think getting really clear on a small number of metrics that are really going to make a difference and also uh, are important to potentially your customers, whether they be tenants or visitors to an attraction or whatever that might be. And then I, I think also uh, the other thing that we've seen um, done quite well is um, wrapping in things like sentiment analysis. So as, as you move more towards the you know, are people having a, a good experience with this? And, you know, is it delivering the results that they expect? Finding ways to um, understand if, you know, uh, and solicit feedback from people. Um, and that can be done in, in very basic ways, doesn't necessarily have to be via apps and that kind of thing. But I think um, surfacing that information can be um, really valuable um, in terms of adjusting the experience over time and also making sure in future spend, um, is spent in a really effective way. So it is actually making a difference. It's not just 
potentially producing even more information. Yeah, great comments. Thank you. So let's just take, we've got to, um, I'll read some comments that have come in, um, but now's the time for questions. We've got five minutes, guys. If um, if you have anything you want to, you want um, us to answer, please type it in. Uh, first one here from Ruben. Uh, it says, very interesting canvas. Um, parallel with you, we are also working on this kind of roadmap for smart buildings on the Belgium level. We think the smart building consultant could already be valuable, necessary from step one on. Too often, smart buildings are seen as a choice of technology. And in our opinion, it isn't at all. Technology helps to fulfill the needs of the users. Um, in our opinion, the smart building consultant could already play an important role in finding out what the functional needs are before going into the technology. Um, always open for a discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great comment. Certainly would definitely echo that, right? Like. The, the the technology is like the enabler for the thing that you want to achieve right not the it's not the it's not the the end of the journey right, right mike yeah and i would echo that entirely ruben i think um always start functionally as we were um uh, saying earlier up at the top there in terms of um uh, you know the why you know, what is it we want to get out of this there should be a set of very clear functional requirements, what do we want the building to do and achieve before we then go and start um, you know, looking at and spending money potentially uh, in our section four on technology. Because yeah, if you just go shopping for the technology systems, A, you'll probably find it very difficult to get them to work together, but B, the experience for end users and people that operate the space, um, yeah, will be uh, confused, I think is probably mm -hmm. yeah. the word. Uh, Jessica adds to that, our company is using the term technology general contractor. Interesting one. Um, yeah, exactly. Align the technology to a purpose. Yes, that is what we think. A uh, comment here from Paul. Um, still appears that owner investors start with the direct question. If I spend X, will I get Y? It's not always about those types of returns. It's not going to guarantee a rental premium yet. We're still in a trial and error phase. What data can we extract? How is it useful? Not everyone is used to thinking differently, but we are getting there. Yeah, interesting comment. I mean, Mike, from your perspective, you know, you've been doing this a while. Have you seen an evolution with the kind of companies now that you deal with and what their expectations are and like how, when they come to you, like how green they are? Um, yeah, I think the... The conversation shifted for us probably not too far before the pandemic, where it moved from kind of what is a smart building to, to how do I get one? Um, but I, I do agree with Paul entirely. We do have people who call us up and say, if I spend X, how much will I get Y in return? And again, as Paul said, we're just not in that position just yet in terms of um, market maturity. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, it, around the requirements, I think we're in a good place now, kind of Pareto-wise, that we're probably about 80% of the way there. I think they're feeling like, you know, people are turning up with very consistent expectations in that space. Yeah. It is then um, the differentiation and the what else could we do or how does it impact the um, the actual audience for the building, if you like, that I think is is the is the difference. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I think you know it, it is part of the reason for having these conversations, right? We're it's it's early. We're not yes yet a mass market, and um, yeah, there are developers that <laughs> we've talked to uh, are not going to touch this with a barge pole until they see the rest of the industry do it. But yeah. thankfully, there are some people out in the world um, looking to innovate, and I think also. Um, you know, whilst the pandemic uh, has not been uh, great for anyone, uh, it is at least driving some of the change or accelerating uh, the change that we do need in buildings, not least just from a kind of um, quality of offering perspective. I think um, it has had good disruptive force in that regard. Yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're right. We're, this, we're not reached uh, by any stretch of the imagination, like mass market, right, for, for these types of technology. Um, and we, we talked about this, you know, I did a podcast with a um, guy that wrote um, Crossing the Chasm, um, you know, and he talks about technology adoption, like 
and he, he wrote this book back in the 90s right, about how uh, technology was adopted then. It still applies today. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we're on this um, journey towards sort of more mainstream adoption. And um, I think, you know, I, we've, I've seen improvements for sure over the last few years. Um, just a few things to finish off, and I'll let Mike have a few um, words to finish as well. Um, please download the, the canvas. I'm considering like maybe setting up a somewhere where we, we you know we can people can come and give their opinion on how to develop the canvas. So maybe we set up some kind of repository or GitHub where they can add to this document. But I'll have to think about that. But um, we certainly really want people to contribute to this and make it better. So um, please do. Uh, and if um, yeah, you've got any questions for us, um, you can you can email us. I'm sure if you go to uh, Mike's website, you'll find some contact details. Same with us as well, memory.com. Mike, any uh, final thoughts? Um, nothing really to to add. Just thanks very much for everyone's time. Really appreciate uh, listening. And yeah, we'd just uh, very much echo Jim's comments about uh, potential contributors. Please do uh, get in touch. This isn't us. Uh, sat here saying that we have all the answers, uh, <laughs> nor have we um, considered every single possible permutation of um, buildings, technology, or anything else. So, um, yeah, as as far as I'm concerned, this is very much the start of a set of conversations and hoping to um, benefit the industry overall and, and move things forward. Exactly, exactly that. So, yeah, let's finish it there, guys. Um, thanks again for listening. Um, I will be posting the recording uh, tomorrow. I think you'll probably get a get a, a link to it um, in your email box. So great. Thanks again. Um, look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye-bye. And again, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jim.